the year was 2008. I was 19, a bright-eyed sophomore in college, lapping up every ounce of my ever-expanding universe. I lived on campus in Galloway Hall, a beautiful, albeit creaky, uh, women's dormitory that just so happened to be on the National Register of Historic Places. Every Tuesday night after dinner in the cafeteria, my best friend Heather and I hosted a Bible study on my dorm room floor. We boiled water from the sink in an electric hot pot, busted out my collection of herbal tea bags and offered cups of tea to everybody who came. It was a communion of sorts. Technically speaking, our Bible study was overseen by a regional, non-denominational campus ministry organization that promoted groups like ours on college campuses across the South. One day, in the middle of fall, the campus ministry director, who I'm going to call Steve, invited Heather and I to join him for coffee. Steve was a nice, middle-aged guy. He was probably about the age of our dads at that time. And over coffee, we told Steve that we had signed up to attend a Christian social justice conference over the upcoming winter break. And we were really excited about it. We knew that there was going to be music and speakers and the opportunity to gather with young, justice-oriented Christians from around the country. As we sat there sipping our cafe mochas, I watched as Steve became visibly uncomfortable with our upcoming plans. Very calmly and a little patronizingly, he explained to us that in the organization he represented, they believed that social justice was, quote, incompatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. After Heather and I picked our jaws up off the floor, Steve gave us an ultimatum. Disavow our interest in social justice or be dismissed immediately from leadership in the organization. We chose the second option. And my faith has never been the same since. Today, an experience like that probably would not surprise me all that much, but back then, it shook me to my core. How could two people read the same Bible and come up with two such opposing interpretations? Now, if you step back and look around at the Christians that you know, some are probably Catholic, some are probably Protestant, some probably think it's really weird that your pastor is a woman, others wouldn't bat an eyelid at me, some feel God's presence most in worship, some feel God's presence most when they're receiving communion, some people feel God's presence most strongly when they're serving the poor. And still others rarely feel God's presence at all. Their faith is more of a fact than an experience. We all follow the same Jesus. And yet sometimes, at least, it feels like we're all going down slightly different paths. To name my own example again, how can one person say that social justice is integral to the gospel while another believes that it is incompatible? I'll never forget the first time I got glasses. I was 14, about, and I remember that first day taking our dog for a walk down our suburban street and feeling like the entire world had been lit up in technicolor. Were leaves always supposed to have been this sharp? Were blades of grass always supposed to have looked this crisp? 
Were flowers always supposed to have been this vibrant? Was the world always supposed to look this clear? Yes. These days, I often find myself attempting to explain to Esme, who is very inquisitive, why I have to put my contacts in in the morning before I can see to do things. Which, if you've ever tried explaining something like that to a three-year-old, you know that it's a pretty tricky thing to do. It's just about as hard as explaining the difference between God and Jesus, or the reason why we sometimes in church come forward and get a little piece of bread and a little cup of juice, or the meaning of death, or why bad things happen to good people. Our faith is a mystery, yes, but sometimes a little less mystery and a little more clarity might be helpful. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just pop on some Jesus glasses and suddenly see it all crystal clear? Now, back in Jesus's time, people struggled with this same lack of clarity. When Jesus returns to his hometown of Nazareth, and gets up to read from the scriptures in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, the congregation cannot see his reason for being there. They're unable to understand exactly what Jesus has come to do. Is he going to condemn us or accept us? Is he going to teach us something intellectual or fix our practical down-to-earth problems? Is he going to do magic tricks or start a political uprising? What is this Jesus guy all about? Their eyes may have been fixed on him, but their minds were turning with all the possibilities. Now Jesus' response is to pick up the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and begin reading. And he reads this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. How's that for clarity? When Jesus takes a highlighter to his Bible, this is the verse that gets underlined. He says, I am here to do the following things in the power of the Holy Spirit. Bring good news to the poor, release the captives, restore the sight of the blind, set the oppressed free, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. According to the Gospel of Luke, this is Jesus's mission statement. These are the inaugural words of Jesus's ministry. The very first thing that he says immediately after being baptized at the River Jordan and then tempted by Satan in the wilderness. This statement of mission opens the door to Jesus's three-year ministry. That's why it comes so early in the Gospel of Luke. That's why it's in chapter four. These words quoted from the prophet Isaiah, are the lens through which Jesus wants the people to view all that is to come, his teachings, his healings, his miracles. This is why he's here. On that day, in the synagogue in Nazareth, Jesus announces a spiritually grounded social justice movement. Now, it's 2022, and in, in some ways, I wish that there was a, a better or a different phrase than social justice, because the phrase social justice has become so co-opted by our culture, and it's become so politically charged in our culture right now. And I'm not here to promote any political ideology or agenda. I'm just here to proclaim the gospel. But the fact of the matter 
is that the gospel has implications for how we order and run our families, our churches, our communities, and our society at large. Jesus makes that abundantly clear. The primary image that Jesus calls upon to illustrate his mission statement is the year of the Lord's favor, which you might have also heard called the year of Jubilee. Is anyone familiar with this concept? Okay, I see, yeah, heads nodding. So I'm going to take you on a brief history lesson here. Try to stay with me. So in the book of Joshua, after being delivered from slavery and then wandering in the desert for 40 years, God's people finally, finally, finally enter the promised land. And when God's people finally enter the promised land, God instructs them to cast lots in order to divide up the land so that each tribe of people receives their own allotment. Every family gets their own land, and it looked something like this. Can you leave, leave that up for a minute, uh, Rob, please, if you don't mind? So they divide up the land, but over the course of time, certain families and people fall upon hard times, and they end up having to sell their land. And then some people who have fallen upon hard times fall upon even harder times, and then they are forced to sell themselves into slavery in order to survive. And therefore, just as the world works today, some people profit at the expense of others' misfortune, and the map begins to look a lot less equally divided. Perhaps the purple regions disappear altogether, overtaken by the orange. Perhaps the blue dissolves into yellow and the green into brown. And before you know it, the land is no longer divided between 12 tribes. Now there's only one or two colors on the map. Now there's a class system. You've got the landowners and the paid workers and the slaves. And here's where the year of the Lord's favor comes in. This thing that Jesus says that he's come to make happen. In Leviticus chapter 25, God commands that every 50 years, all of Israelite society get a do-over, a mulligan, a second chance. Every 50 years. So this is probably only going to happen once in each person's lifetime, every person goes back to the land that God originally gave them. If you had to sell your land, the land becomes yours again. If you bought somebody else's land, you got to use it for 50 years, but now you have to give it back. If you had to sell yourself into slavery, you're free. If you purchase slaves, you have to let them go. The entire society gets a do-over. Everybody goes back home. Now, how amazing is it that of all, out of all 613 laws in the Old Testament, this is the one that Jesus chooses to highlight? Why? Why would he do that? Well, because... The year of the Lord's favor is the tangible, down-to-earth manifestation of the deep spiritual truth that God has been revealing from the very beginning of time, which is that every person and everything in this world is created by God, loved by God, and belongs to God. Yesterday, our church held our monthly food pantry. We gave away bread and chicken and eggs and rice and cereal and bananas and other stuff to 171 people. Anyone who showed up, anyone who said, hey, you know what? I need help. I'm hungry. I need a second chance. This week, our church is providing home-cooked meals 
six nights in a row for our local shelter for families who are experiencing homelessness, families who need a do-over in life. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to follow Jesus in 2022, in America, in New England? This is it. According to Jesus, it's got to look like good news to the poor, release for the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, freedom for the oppressed, and the year of the Lord's favor. That's what Jesus said. Amen. Beloved, I invite you to ask yourself this question. Will you follow Jesus today? He didn't say that it was going to be easy. Will you let your life be used by Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit for the transformation of the world? If you want to follow Christ anew this morning or for the very first time today, you can. You get a second chance. You can have a fresh start. You get a do-over. All you have to say is, yes, Lord, I want to follow you.